great. Um, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, I appreciate you uh, accepting this paper. And I want to say thanks to the collabor coll our collaborators down here, especially Carla Janes, who put in a substantial amount of work to, uh, to bring this together. And as Brian said, I'm talking about validating mass motion for egress purposes. <clears throat> I'm actually a planner, and so this is a different kind of audience for me, a different kind of venue. But uh, I'm a practitioner in helping to design large infrastructure, um, as you can see on the board. And in that realm, I'm working with a lot of micro simulation models, um, discrete event scenarios, and my favorite, which is Excel. I can't imagine that anything ever happened before Excel was invented. Um, so that's a little bit of context, and I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I'm looking forward to some uh, interesting response at the close of this, based on what I have to say today. Now, specifically, mass motion we've been using for a number of years now. We have a development team in Toronto that uh, leads the development, and I'm sort of on the client side, looking to my clients to help uh, develop and progress the model. And really, since 2007, 2008, we've been using it fairly heavily. And I think it just went commercial a couple months ago. So to give you some context of what it looks like, and this is a bit of a roll the dice, and it works. Um, there's a station in Toronto where we were doing the, the planning. And the key issue here was understanding how that, that below grade concourse level really functioned. Because if you've been to Toronto, you know there's a lot of underground living that happens there. And so the station had a lot of uh, subgrade connections that the architect was interested in visualize, visualizing. This was a very simple sketch model to help a client understand what 8,000 people per hour looked like traveling on a set of escalators and stairs and to try to decide whether to go with a stacked vertical circulation system versus a staggered one. So pretty quick sketch up model for a simple purpose. At the other end of the spectrum from high use, heavily populated space was this uh, new museum proposed in the Middle East where we're looking at different processes like ticket purchasing and information desk and coat check and groups passing through the space. So the architect wanted to get a sense of how that all is going to operate um, and does it meet his vision for how the space should look. And then closer to home, at least closer to home for me, a, a new uh, education building in New York and Manhattan where, uh, as you can imagine, in the city, there's not a lot of space for giant campus buildings. And so this is a vertically stacked campus building, eight stories of classrooms and, and uh, lecture theaters. And the challenge here was really to help the architect understand what 3,000 people in 20 minutes really meant in the space. And you can imagine that's more like, that's like Grand Central operating. It's a, really, it's a lot of people. Um, so we were testing what the door arrangement should be with the, the ID check. Not really security screening, but ID check. Um, and we sat with the registrar to make sure they were comfortable with the delay that students were, were having when they came in or left. Um, as I said, with the architect, and then again with the uh, security team who's going to have to manage this on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is a long video. It doesn't really get to the busiest point, but you get the idea. This is, this is about 10 minutes before class starts. So now that you've seen a bit of mass motion, uh, I'll just describe it to you in, in a few words. Um, every entity in, in, in mass motion is an agent. They have vision, so they can actually see the space that they're walking through. They can see portals, they can see each other. Uh, and it does integrate with most um, 3D CAD and modeling environments, uh, bringing in those files. And every agent's got a, a set of uh, drivers that, look, that, that push it through the space. And the developers in Toronto, they call this uh, reflexive and contemplative. Uh, in, in my mind, it really boils down to four things. There's a, a route choice function, which helps it decide how it gets from A to B from its orig origin to destination. So it's sorting out those global movements and decision making. And there's a social forces algorithm, which helps it decide uh, how it interacts with other agents in the space. Um, a set of speed profiles, largely based on Fruin's research back in 1970. So there's a preferred speed there that the agents try to attain in, a, in an unconstrained environment. 
and then there's a series of functions that 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 change that speed function based on density or grade or the type of uh, in the type of surface that it's on. And so these four levers, if you will, are working together to drive how agents move through the space. And for normal movement, and we've done this for a number of years now, uh, in terms of quote validation. We've looked at all these uh, a number of different scenarios from lowly populated to densely populated, uh, unidirectional, bidirectional, moving through doorways, uh, corridors, circuitous corridors and around corners, vertical circulation, escalators and stairs, and running a series of tests to make sure that what the model is showing us is what we would expect. And we've done this a lot for the, for the normal movement, but you can see uh, what's missing here is a stacked um, vertical circulation core. So our colleagues in the fire engineering realm are always saying, well, tell me, is it validated for egress purpose? And I'm, I'm looking back at John Barrow, who yesterday presented uh, Hudson Yards with the steps model when he could have been using mass motion. So the question is, has this been validated for mass motion? Uh, sorry, has this been validated for egress purposes? And that's the purpose of this research, is to go through and uh, make a statement about that. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is create better, safer environments for people. You know, essentially, that's it. And at the same time, increase some efficiencies and reduce costs for our clients. Now, I was uh, slightly nervous when Richard spoke first about the number of guidelines that might be out there in terms of uh, movement um, standards. And like him, we didn't find that many. So we went back to what we knew, which is transportation and pedestrian modeling. And the National Cooperative Highway Research Program has a really good, succinct definition between calibration and validation, where validation is testing the, the, testing the models on empirical data, which is not used to calibrate the model. So making your inputs equal your outputs, uh, population in, population out, counts in, counts out, whatever that might be, that's calibration. Validation is on the, uh, the emergent properties that, that evolve when you look at a, a densely populated model. model. And in London, where they've been using Legion for a number of years, um, they have this standard which suggests that journey times in your model should match observed journey times within plus or minus 10%. Now, in this realm, they're actually talking about a specific station model and matching that to observe, but at least it gives us uh, a property to target and an actual number. So in what I'm about to present, we're looking at when we talk about validation, we're talking about measured emergent behaviors, total evacuation time, individual journey times, flows and stairwells through doors, and, and a, a bit of a qualitative assessment about how agents and people move. The first phase is actually our building in New York, uh, where we had a planned drill back in 2009. <clears throat> Arup sits on floors two and then 10 through 14, and the, and, the, and the fire group actually sits on two, closest to the exits, as you might expect. Um, tenth floor is sparsely populated. It's basically meeting rooms and conference rooms. So the bulk of the population sits towards the top of the building, 11, 12, 13, and 14. We had a good portion of people at work that day. Uh, it was a planned egress uh, drill, so people did know about it, which I think is a key point for all of these tests is that they were drills. And so the, the pre-movement time that we just learned about was really minimized, if you will. There wasn't a lot of decision-making that had to take place. You basically heard the drill, you knew it was coming, and then you left. So this building egressed in about seven minutes, 24 seconds. Uh, just a, a bit of background on the, on the building. I should say that uh, there's two, this is the front of the building. Stairwell X is in the front, and Y is in the back. And on the left side of the page, you can see stairwell X. And that's right next to the main elevators and is also adjacent to the internal circulation of the building. So this is the common, this is the most commonly used vertical circulation. And then the back of the building is Y. Uh, we position people at each one of these door, doorways on the heavily populated floors to get counts, which we use for calibration and calibration of stair choice as well that also gave us those numbers about how many people were passing through these portals through any period of time, which we talked about in terms of validation. We set up video cameras on the 11th floor, front and back stairwell, 
to try to uh, get a sense of the movement through that. And also journey times, so you can see Danielle there in the red jacket. When she passed, we knew exactly what time she passed, the 11th floor, and then we used the uh, security cameras on ground floor to, to understand what time she left, and therefore we can extract journey times. So this is the model. And you can see uh, second floor here, populated with desks, file cabinets, all that kind of thing. And then the heavily populated floors, 10 through 14 at the top. And you can see this bias towards the front stair stairwell X because that's what people know and what they're used to. <clears throat> Incidentally, you'll see it later, but people who used Y tended, well, a few specific people ran down the staircase, which kind of threw off our data, but you can't win them all. OK. So the video on the left is not working, but had it been working, you would see some correlation between the way that people are using the staircase and the way the model is suggesting people use the staircase. So uh, didn't throw up anything crazy. We don't have agents getting stuck in corners or turning around or anything like that. It's pretty regular flow. <clears throat> so you know, in our qualitative assessment, we were uh, producing movements that were valid. When we talk about individual journey time, we extracted samples from our video footage, not 232 samples, but you know, 12 percent, and balanced those or measured those against the gross average evacuation time of all agents in those models. And the result was actually quite surprising. We are uh, <coughs> modeling much more slowly than the people moved within the space. And so that brings up an interesting point, which I'm going to touch on later. Then we looked at the ground floor counts, uh, comparison of the, uh, uh, the flows as they were exiting the actual ground floor at, uh, staircase. We have a, a decent pattern correlation. You can see that there's this oops, peak for second floor. Uh, people and then the trough before the uh, 11th floor people hit the ground. <clears throat> and what I was saying earlier is that those folks that ran down stairwell Y kind of threw off the data set here, so we have more people reaching the ground floor earlier. And also, as I touched on, we had we we literally went through a process of shifting the data to try to zero out this pre-movement time because, in terms of journey time and building exits, we wanted to make sure we we're matching like for like and zeroing on that, that, that variable of uh, pre-movement time. And then the result of this in looking at you know, what we saw in the journey times is that the model is running a bit more slowly. We've got this gap towards the tail end, which uh, corresponds to that slow journey time. Now, in, in terms of the cumulative exits, in stairwell, while we do get this really good um, slope correlation during the bulk of the evac, which was nice. We're happy to see that. And stairwell X in the front of the building, there's a bit of a gap in the delay. Um, again, suggesting that the model's pushing people slightly slowly through the staircases. And you can also see this, uh, this yellow gap here is, is, is that, again, that group that ran down the stairwell that got down to the ground floor before, uh, before most people did. Now, on the positive side, or the better news, is that overall, <clears throat> our observed evacu uh, our modeled evacuation time was all of 25 seconds longer than observed. And when we looked at the staircase uh, flows, every, 16, every 15 seconds when it was densely occupied, we observed 14 people and we modeled 15. So there's a good correlation there. So we began to wonder about what this, wh why is it that why is it that we're uh, predicting slower speeds? And you know, it could be a function of the model. It could be a function of the population. We do have a, a younger, somewhat younger population in the building. Not young like Facebook or Google, but compared to other engineering firms, you know, the median age is less than 35. So that could have been a factor. The second phase, um, given that positive result in the overall evac evacuation time, we looked at three other buildings where Arab Fire had done some, um, some recent work. 
two buildings in lower manhattan at hanover square and broad street and one in london of varying scales, varying populations in different locations. Hanover Square, the observed ev evac time was 13 minutes and we, were, we nearly nailed that just over by 14 seconds. Um, this is a fa fairly regular floor plate, you know, desks and offices around the perimeter, stair core in the middle. 85 Broad Street, observed evac time was 18 minutes and we modeled it at 1641. And then Canary Wharf, observed evac time was 20 minutes and we modeled it at 2153. And uh, out of interest, this group might be interested to know that there were several thousand people in this building. 53% chose the stairs, the other half used the elevators. So it was a combined stair, elevator, egress. So this is the result. You know, we're pretty close on every one of these. And, you know, from our point of view, that suggests that this should be a suitable platform for modeling egress. Um, according to our criteria, plus or minus 10%, we're there. We do uh, have some interest in, in understanding what's happening at the local level a bit more, but uh, as was brought up numerous times, we don't have a lot of data for that. We've only got one set that we collected with the video and the counts. Those other three buildings didn't have that. So with that, I actually want to pose that question to this audience is, would you agree? Is it valid? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. We have some questions. Hi, um, I just want to make sure I understood correctly. The way you did your, um, your first um, model in your, in your office in New York, um, you zeroed in, your, you, you normalized your pre-movement to zero to match um, w what the building occupants had. However, noticing that y your model has quite a bit of artificial intelligence built into it to account for all these issues. So when you, when you actually do an, an egress model to determine your total egress time, um, do, how do you do that? How do you account for pre-movement and, and factors of safety if you've already normalized it to zero? Do you keep adding time or do you use the ability of your model to, to do it all in the model and not include a, a, a factor of safety? Um, well, I'll clarify one. The, the overall evac time here does incorporate a pre-movement time. So this is time from the alarm. When we looked at the specific metrics in the stairwell, we wanted to zero out that and just understand what was happening in the stairwell. So that did not include pre-movement time in those, in those metrics. But as for how you use it in practice, that's uh, you know, not my, not, I don't work in the fire realm, so I can't speak to how pre-movement time should be incorporated or not. Sorry about that. Um, just a question, did you try just uh, checking the total clearance times with uh, a simple, the SFP guide with the simple model that Paul's came up in the 1970s, just uh, to get some idea of how that compares? We, um, for the two lower Manhattan buildings and, and the one at Canary Wharf, we actually have steps models for all of those. And yeah, so we did a comparison on those. Simple hand count. No, we did not. I didn't do that, no. Any other questions? Yes. How did you create the bias for uh, people going to the uh, one stair as opposed to the other in the model? We had, to, we had to manually dictate that. So we ran it first. We just let agents go to the closest exit, and there was more of a you know, closer to 50-50 split. Then we had in order to match the counts that we took, we had to push people towards stairwell X. Time for one last question, anyone? Okay, I, I did want to ask also, is the data sets that you validated against available anywhere um, for comparison with other, other tools? These, um, this table is in the paper in terms of the bottom three being, I mean, that's the data that we have in terms of overall time or schematics or setup or anything like that mm -hmm. for initial conditions that you modeled with? It's not in the public realm, okay. I don't think. Okay, thanks. Okay, we'll go to our next speaker. Thank you, Eric. Okay, thanks.